I want to welcome everybody to Hawthorne University's Holistic Health and Nutrition webinar series. And I'm here with Dr. Liz Lipsky today, and we both wanted to take an opportunity to say hi, everybody, live. Um, Liz is here to present the power of the right diet and digestive and immune issues, and we're going to find out which diet to choose for the right client in the right circumstances. So I'm really looking forward to that. And, you know, I expect we're going to have some terrific information like we always do from Dr. Lipsky. So we're recording this and the replay will be up on our website in just a few days. And I want you to ask questions. We want you to provide your comments. So you've got the webinar question panel there. So please, at any moment, just ask your questions and your comments, and then I'll pose them for you at the end of the presentation when we have Q&A. Just, just to give you a preview of the um, presentation tonight, we're going to address many therapeutic dietary approaches for working with people who have immune and digestive issues. So we're going to focus on the clinical thought process to provide for the best therapeutic benefit, and we'll explore the current research on specific therapeutic diets and how to determine which one works best by looking at the core root issues. It's really an honor and pleasure to have you with us again, Dr. Lipsky. So I'm going to introduce you for everybody. Dr. Lipsky is a professor of clinical nutrition and the director of academic development, nutrition and integrative health at Maryland University of Integrative Health. She is board certified in clinical nutrition and holistic nutrition as a nutrition specialist and in functional medicine. She's nationally known for her pioneering work and expertise in the field of functional and integrative nutrition and digestive health. Liz is faculty member at the Institute for Functional Medicine for the Metabolic Medicine Fellowship through A4M. She's a board member for the Accreditation Council for Nutrition Professional Education, an advisory board member for the International Association of Health Coaches and the Autism Hope Alliance. Dr. Lipsky is a contributing author for the book Integrative Gastroenterology, co-authored a chapter for the IHMT study guide, and is published in peer-reviewed journals. She's the author of Digestive Wellness. We all know Digestive Wellness here. It's been on our materials book list since the onset of Hawthorne. But guess what? There's a brand new fifth edition. I'm so excited, Liz. I'm so <laughs> excited for this to come out. She's Me also too. author The Digestive Connection, Digestive Wellness for Children, and The Leaky Gut Syndrome. And through her work, she is training the next generation of nutritionists and is bringing the current state of the art in clinical nutrition to current healthcare practitioners by speaking at professional conferences, teaching for IFM, and offering webinar based mentoring programs and advanced nutrition forums for nutritionists, dietitians, and other clinicians through her company, Innovative Healing Inc and presenting webinars for Hawthorne from time to time. Liz, it's a thrill to have you back. I'm going to turn it over to you and um, let you begin when you're ready. Great. It's always so great to play with you, Paula. It's um, always my pleasure. So welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Liz Lipsky, and this is a topic that's really near and dear to me. We have so much conversation in the area of different diets. Uh, my son asked me a few months ago, uh, should I be on a ketogenic diet? And um, then, you know, my next door neighbor, should I be on a FODMAP diet? And it's like, wow, they're everywhere. And people are really confused. And we as clinicians are also confused. So I've been thinking really hard for the last year or so about how do I really think about somebody sitting in front of me and what might be most advantageous to them right at the moment. And I'm going to take you through my thought process and show you a little bit of the research that exists on various diets. Um, so here we go. Let's talk about these different diets and let's try to think about the underlying root issues to figure out which diet to use and then be able to use this when you sit down with a client the next time you see somebody. I put together this pyramid. It is a diet pyramid. It's just a different kind of diet pyramid. And I put on it some of the different diets that we use when we're thinking about people with GI issues and immune issues. And when I think about, I've talked before about kind of digestion more as a whole in Hawthorne webinars previously, but for me, when I look at research, a whole foods diet 
that's based on a Mediterranean diet plan, whether that is vegetarian or vegan or has a lot of meat in it, it's really the gold standard. When I look at the research on the benefits of a Mediterranean diet or the benefits of a whole foods diet, what I really see is that those diets reduce cardiovascular disease, cancer incidents, diabetes incidents, um, obesity incidents, and on and on and on. So our ultimate goal is to be able to broaden what somebody can eat so that they can move towards a whole food Mediterranean type of diet. In the autism community, we see a lot of families looking at gluten-free and casein-free diets. And these are interesting diets, yet the research, even in autism, isn't very strong yet. And for me, if I'm going to work with a family and I'm going to ask them to really change their diet, if you've ever worked with a child or an adult who has autism, you'll know that the foods that they love the best all have gluten and dairy in them. Their pizza and cereal with milk and grilled cheese sandwiches and macaroni and cheese and chicken nuggets and um, you name it, but everything has gluten and or dairy in it. And we know from looking at other research that, especially in children, that food dyes, preservatives, sugar, and other additives added to food also could be culprits, and eggs can be a huge culprit. So when I'm working with a family that has kids on the autistic spectrum, what I think is, I'm just going to go for something bigger, and let's see if we can kind of move this um, along. Then we have a six food elimination diet I'm going to talk about in more detail, comprehensive elimination diet, which I'm going to talk about in some de detail dysbiosis diets like the FODMAP diet and specific carbohydrate diet, GAPS diet, going to talk about those. Talk a little bit about paleoimmune diet. Um, mention a restoration diet and then talk about elemental diets. So um, it's a lot to cover in this hour. And the main thing is always you've got all these different people and how do you decide for that particular person, what's going to be right for them. And I think one of the keys to that is listening really carefully to what someone tells you and also um, keeping in mind what you know and blending those two things. The person's tail is really important. So for example, I was working with a woman who came to see me and she had um, a lot of fatigue, a lot of um, feeling like her get up and go had got up and left. And she also had a, um, she'd also been on a very restrictive diet because she wanted to lose weight. And she also had some arthritis and some other issues that were going on. And when I looked at what she was eating, it looked a lot to me like, a specific carbohydrate diet, which I'll show you. And so I said to her, I said, you know, you've done really well on this diet, but I think we can add more foods. And she said, really, I can eat more things than I'm eating? That would be so much fun. And she continued to lose weight and have better energy, even though we had broadened her diet. And so I did that really by looking at what she was eating, listening to her really carefully, and, you know, our ears are really some of our best tools to figure out what's really going to work for one of our clients. At the Institute for Functional Medicine, we use something called the DIGIN model. And one day I was sitting with Dr. Patrick Hannaway in an airport, and he was saying to me, you know, no matter what the diagnosis, I think there's only five different areas that we really need to kind of look at to figure out like what is our therapeutic for people and these five areas um, he gave them to me and then i kind of played around and i said what do you think about dig in 
as uh, an acronym for this, and it kind of stuck. So the DIG-IN model, you know, we always want to look at digestion absorption. With our clientele, sometimes we're working with people who are eating a standard Western diet, and sometimes we're working with people who are eating really very clean diet. They've already tried a lot of different things. Um, but the first question is always, what is someone eating and how are they eating it? Are they eating standing up in their kitchen? Are they eating watching TV? Are they eating in the car? Um, you know, what are they really doing and what are their eating patterns? Are they eating, I was talking to a client recently and she's eating every hour to hour and a half all day long. And when I looked at what she was eating, there was no protein. Well, no wonder her blood sugar wasn't holding. And so it's like, well, let's focus on protein. So the first thing you want to do is always look at what's somebody eating and how can you just clean up, help them um, be educated to better clean up what they're eating. Then you want to start looking at digestion and absorption. Can they actually digest and absorb the food that they're taking in? Do they have enough acid in their stomach? Do they have too much acid in their stomach? Might they benefit from taking digestive enzymes? Have they had their gallbladder removed? And if they have, then maybe um, supplementing with a lipase-loaded enzyme supplement or some ox bile might help them better utilize and digest fats. Um, do they have good motility? Um, and you can check motility by by doing a simple experiment of asking somebody to um, swallow a hand, small handful of charcoal on an empty stomach one morning and see when their stool looks black. Um, and you can kind of get a sense of how long it takes for the food that they eat today to come out. We know that the average American time is somewhere around, uh, I think it's around 40 hours, longer for women, less for men. But what's optimal is 18 to 24 hours. So we can look at motility, or if somebody tells you that they're only having bowel movements like every three days or every two days, you know that they have slow motility. We also want to look at increased intestinal permeability. And we know that that intestinal permeability or le increased intestinal permeability or what we call leaky gut or um, uh, a broken barrier function is um, underlies all autoimmune conditions that have actually been researched. And it may be a precursor to autoimmune conditions. Um, we're also starting to see that it's a, a, a precursor for type 2 diabetes and liver dysfunction and many other conditions. So we want to look and try to assess intestinal permeability. And then we want to consider the gut microbiome and um, is there possibly small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Could there be um, small intestinal fungal overgrowth that we used to call candidiasis? Um, is the gut microbiome in balance or are we seeing somebody that's got a lot of gas and bloating, um, which are big tip-offs that there's probably something going on in the microbiome? Um, do they have inflammation or do they have autoimmune conditions? So is there pain and inflammation? Um, is there immune activation like with food sensitivities or food allergies? Um, do somebody have GERD, which is an inflammation in the esophagus? Does somebody have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, which is an inflammation in the large intestine? And then finally, we want to look at the gut brain. And I don't have time today to really dive into all these categories, yet I wanted you to be really familiar with the dig in model because we're going to look at some of these categories in more detail. So the main GI therapeutic dietary plans are the following. And what I really want to emphasize here is these are therapeutic dietary plans. We want to use these. We want to see if we get a change or a good effect in somebody. 
by recommending one of these diets. And if we do, we want to work with the person and keep them on that diet while we're also working with them to heal their leaky gut and rebalance their lifestyle and rebalance their microbiome and maybe even working with their physicians to um, to work on infections or other underlying issues. Um, so we don't want to have somebody use one of these dietary therapeutic interventions for the rest of their life unless they really need to do it. So for example, we're starting to see a lot of people with lactose intolerance, and that can be a lifelong issue, yet sometimes when a leaky gut is healed and dysbiosis are healed, people become way more tolerant to lactose. I do have to say it hasn't happened for me, and I'm still pretty lactose intolerant. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about fructose intolerance. Um, so when we think about the dig-in model, we've got D for digestion and absorption, and I start thinking about enzyme insufficiencies and these couple of diets. And also, we see a lot of people with sucrose intolerance, too, because of the huge amounts of sugar that people eat. Um, with high fructose corn syrup and white table sugar, people are eating just under 100 pounds of sugar a year, which actually is an improvement from 20 years ago when people were eating about 135 pounds of sweeteners a year. So people are getting the message and we're doing better, but um, 100 pounds a year is a lot of people's entire body weight. So that's a huge amount of sugar. Um, then we also have that we start looking again in the dig in model at the G for the gut microbiome. We start thinking about low and restricted carbohydrate and prebiotic rich diets like FODMAP diet, specific carbohydrate diet, the gut and psychology syndrome diet, and antifungal diets. And then if we have people who have in the second, um, the first and second eye in the dig in model, immune, inflammation, or increased permeability, then we want to start thinking about low antigenic diets. And so we're going to talk about all these categories in more detail. So this is cutting to the chase. This one slide is kind of where we are with the research at this moment in time. If somebody has irritable bowel syndrome or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which about somewhere between 55 to 70% of people who have been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, which is typified by gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, alternating uh, constipation and diarrhea, um, somewhere between 55 and 70% actually have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is diagnosed with a breath test, and you can ask me more about that. Um, and the best research that we have so far indicates that the hands-down winner of a therapeutic diet is the FODMAP diet. Um, although I've seen a lot of people in my own practice who do great with a comprehensive elimination diet. For inflammatory bowel disease, specifically pediatric Crohn's disease and um, adults with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, we're starting to see some really good research on the specific carbohydrate diet. And right now, there's a 46 um, institution global examination of the Mediterranean diet versus the specific carbohydrate diet for people with Crohn's disease. So um, we're, I'm kind of waiting to see what comes out of that. We also have elemental diets which have been used for decades for people with inflammatory bowel disease, parental nutrition um, with an elimination diet. So parental nutrition is basically um, functional foods, um, which are not really much of food at all, um, along with an elimination diet. And then we have one paper on the use of a paleoimmune diet for people with ulcerative colitis. If somebody has celiac disease, Initially, you want to make sure that they know where all the little tiny hidden sources of gluten are. 
that could possibly enter their diet and remove all of those. And um, many times people will feel amazingly better if they have celiac disease just eliminating gluten. But what I've also found is that using a comprehensive elimination diet will actually get a better result and help them heal their leaky gut even faster, but we don't have research on that. Um, eosinophilic esophagitis or gastritis, it's basically like asthma of the esophagus. It's you actually have an allergy reaction right in your esophagus. And we have about 30 papers right now on what's called the six food elimination diet, which I'm gonna talk about. And then we've been using, since the 1980s, we've been using anti-candida diets, anti-fungal diets, such as um, body ecology, from Donna Gates or um, uh, William Crook's anti-candida diet. Um, we have no research on any of these diets, but I can tell you clinically that they work really well. Um, and then for autoimmune disease, I might consider either a paleoimmune diet or an elimination diet. And the paleoimmune is just a much more comprehensive elimination diet, and it eliminates all grains not only um, gluten-free grains, but all grains are eliminated from that. Um, so depending on how far you can push somebody, this is what we have currently in the research. So if somebody comes to you and they already have a diagnosis, this is where I would go. I would start with this slide and say, okay, this person has a diagnosis. Now let me see which of these I'm going to use. So let's start by looking at digestion and absorption, specifically enzyme insufficiencies. So enzyme insufficiencies, we have something called exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And then, as I mentioned before, we can have lactose, fructose, or sucrose intolerance. And non-celiac gluten sensitivity, well, is that an enzyme insufficiency? We don't really know. So lactose intolerance in Italy, what they did was they gave 205 people a lactose tolerance breath test to see if they could absorb and utilize lactose. And um, what they found was it varied greatly depending on where in Italy they even came from. So in Northern Italy, you know, 52% of people were lactose intolerant and in Central Italy only 19%. So you can see like probably based on where your grandparents were from, where your great grandparents were from, and um, what your heritage is may determine how well you utilize lactose. Um, what we see is um, another Italian study. What we see is that fructose intolerance looks just like irritable bowel syndrome with bloating, abdominal pain, diarrhea. And um, what they did was they took fruit and high fructose corn syrup and lactose out of people's diets for three months. And 76% of these people changed, actually followed through with it. And of these people, 5% had a complete resolution of their symptoms, which seems pretty low, but another two thirds had a great improvement. So in about two thirds of people, just removing um, a lot of fruit um, and uh, dairy from their diet gave them a big bang for their buck. We also have something called exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And um, again, when you look at the symptoms, they look just like irritable bowel syndrome, except Sometimes people have really foul smelling stools that float. Sometimes those stools are tan or really pale. Um, and sometimes they're even frothy. That's called steatorrhea. And um, sometimes you can also see this by seeing undigested food in your stool. Um, and people have weight loss sometimes if they don't have uh, enough digestive enzymes because they can't actually digest the food to get it to their cells. Um, so, you know, if you look, um, pancreatitis, 
plays a role in this or any kind of pancreatic issues. And then we start looking at other, other um, diagnoses. So if you've been diagnosed with celiac or Crohn's or pancreatic insufficiency, if you've had GI surgery that um, has affected uh, the shape of your digestive system for either bariatric surgery or for Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, you may not be absorbing foods. Um, if people have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth um, or ulcerative colitis, you also want to think about that. And basically, the testing that can be done with pretty much any lab um, is pancreatic elastis, which elastates, which is a stool test. And you want to see levels optimally above 400 micrograms per gram. But if you see levels that are less than 200, somebody has some pancreatic insufficiency. And if you see levels less than 100, you really want to be on it and you want to be supplementing with pancreatic enzymes. Um, so fructose malabsorption. and um, what it looks like again is it looks just like irritable bowel syndrome. And genetic fructose malabsorption is really rare, one in 20,000 to 30,000 people, and it's genetic. But what's happened is because we're eating about 40 pounds a year of high fructose corn syrup, and we're eating so much more fruit than ever before, that we're finding that about a third of Americans are actually pretty fructose intolerant. And um, this is more common in women than men. And again, it looks just like IBS. So um, it's something to consider. And especially when we're working with somebody who has Crohn's disease, you can see that 61% of people with Crohn's disease have fructose malabsorption, 42% have lactose malabsorption, and 29% actually have both. Um, I haven't been able to find any data on fructose malabsorption in people with celiac or ulcerative colitis, but you can see that a significant amount of people with ulcerative colitis have lactose malabsorption, and it's not a huge issue in people with celiac once they've been treated. So that's kind of what I wanted to say about enzyme insufficiencies, um, and then I want to next move to dysbiosis diets, which are diets where we really start restricting people's carbohydrate intake. Now, the low FODMAP diet was hypothesized by Dr. Um, doctors Peter Gibson and Sue Shepard in 2004 or 2005. And they hypothesized this diet that it would be really great for people with um, inflammatory bowel disease. And that hasn't really uh, demonstrated to be that true for most people. But this diet has tons of research by now on people who have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and people who have irritable bowel syndrome. And what the diet actually looks like is it um, stands for FODMAPs. Ferment, it low in fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, which is lactose in this case, monosaccharides, which is fructose in this case, and polyols, which are sugar alcohols that I usually think, you know, they come in processed foods and bars and things like that, but they also come in foods like avocados so um, and asparagus have little amounts of them. And so these foods are limited and really the best place that I know to kind of look and get good lists on this is that the University of Monash um, in Australia has an app that you can buy for about five dollars and it lists every food with red, green, yellow and so you can really get um, a, a sense of like what you can and can't eat um, and how much of it you can eat and stick with this diet. Now, some of the issues with this diet is this diet, all of these FODMAPs are prebiotics. And prebiotics are the food for the microbiome. And 
we find them in starchy foods and a lot of different things. And so what you'll see is when you start looking at what you can eat, most of these foods are kind of low in prebiotics. Um, and uh, most of these are pretty low in prebiotics, um, which we need actually to serve us. And then when you see the foods that contain FODMAPs, you can see that they have, that they're fermentable, that they have lots of starch in them. So think root vegetables and things that have a lot of soluble fiber. Um, and so what people do is they go on this diet and um, let me just kind of talk about who benefits from it. I lost my, there, there we go. Okay, so, um, so um, who benefits from a low FODMAP diet? So I've already said functional GI disorders. If you've got irritable bowel syndrome, gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, you might really benefit from this diet. And it should be undertaken for at least two months. Um, two to three months, typically. And um, it's often used when you've already tried a gluten-free diet and you didn't really get a benefit. We have one or two studies that took people who had tried gluten-free and didn't feel better, and then they went on a FODMAP diet and they did feel better. Um, but it's really interesting to me because we're now starting just in the last year to start to see, a year or two to start seeing papers that look at the FODMAP diet and says, hmm, is this really better than a comprehensive elimination diet? How much better is it than a Mediterranean diet? Um, is it any better than just a gluten and dairy-free diet? Does it work any better than just counting carbohydrates or counting calories? And so we're starting to see that even though uh, this diet hit the ground running with tons of research, they did it right, that now that we've been using this for 10 or 12 years, there's starting to be more questions about, is it really that useful? So um, I would say it is really useful. And one area um, that I think it's really useful for, but we don't have any research yet, is that it lowers histamines. So eightfold reduction in urine, urinary histamines. And we're starting to see so many people who have mast cell um, issues, who have uh, issues with hives and high histamine reactions, that this might be a great diet for, for people who um, actually have mast cell activation or other histamine issues, but we don't have any research on that. What you can see is that, is that um, your metabolome, which is how your metabolism runs, like before you go on the diet and after, when they look at it, your metabolism is really different. Well, you kind of want it to be really different because you've got a low growing infection usually, you want to like starve out the bugs that are causing you to feel sick. Um, but then you eventually wanna go back to your regular food plan and keep increasing what you can eat so that you don't stay on this. Um, what it also demonstrates, it's good for the microbiome in some ways. Your actinobacteria um, get uh, stronger and you have greater diversity of the microbiome, but we also see that bifidobacteria, which are really important, go in a straight line down after four weeks on the diet. Um, so, you know, uh, we don't want to keep somebody on this diet for terribly long. So how do we do this diet? So first, six to eight weeks of eliminating all FODMAPs. And what you hope to see is that somebody feels remarkably better. If they don't feel remarkably better, either this isn't the right diet or diet isn't their main issue. Then what you want to do over the next five weeks is reintroduce the FODMAP 
high FODMAP foods one group at a time and kind of watch for symptoms to reemerge. So for example, you might start with lactose or you might start with high fructose sugar uh, fruits like apples and pears and see how somebody does on that. Um, I remember in one of my mentoring groups once there was a, a nutritionist and she had tried a million diets. And when she went on the FODMAP diet, what she found was it was those polyols, those alcohol sugars, who were really um, giving her problems in the natural food she was eating. So, you know, you want to kind of do this slowly and carefully and reintroduce. And then um, you want to continue on the diet with the addition of a tolerated food. And you might need to take something out and put it back in it because you're not really sure. Um, but you can do that. And then you want to, um, long-term maintenance is you want to avoid foods that still give you problems, but you want to really be able to expand over time what someone can eat. And if this diet works really well for somebody, I would consider asking their physician to recommend um, antibiotics or something, probably rifaximin, to um, see if if uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth was an underlying issue. I might work with herbs such as oil of oregano or berberine compounds to see if that might help somebody to, um, to, be, able to, to be able to eventually eat more foods. And I don't want to do whatever I needed to do to kind of help them heal their leaky gut. So here are some um, resources for you. And as I mentioned, there's also that great app from the University of Monash, um, which is about $5. And I think it's really fantastic. In fact, those of you who still have my picture up, I'm going to open my screen and I'm going to find FODMAP. Um, And I can show you the FODMAP diet right there. And then if I um, open up the food guide, I can look at um, breads and cereals. And so I've got almond meal. Well, I just made almond meal um, muffins that are specific carbohydrate compliant. But I can see here there's a big red dot, which means no almond meal, too many prebiotics in it. Um, so, so, you know, it's a great app and I encourage you to get that, um, directly from whatever app store you use. Um, and here's some references on what I just talked about. The specific carbohydrate diet is one that I really love and I used a lot when I was in clinical practice. Um, it was first given to Dr. Elaine Goschel. Um, by Dr. Sidney Haas. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Dr. Haas um, saw Dr. Gottschall's daughter um, as a patient. She had ulcerative colitis, and he put her on this specific carbohydrate diet, and her ulcerative colitis completely disappeared. That inspired Elaine Gottschall to go get her PhD in nutrition, and also to write this book, Breaking the Vicious Cycle. And um, what we know is right now, the research demonstrates that who benefits most are kids with pediatric Crohn's disease and adults who have um, Crohn's and inflammatory bowel disease and people who know that they can't break down disaccharides like, like um, lactose and um, sucrose. And um, yeah, so anybody who has like damage to their microvilli probably has problems breaking down disaccharides because the, the disaccharidases are secreted at like lactase, is secreted at the tippy tops of those microvilli. So if they're blunted at all, then you're not gonna be able to digest lactose very well. And the same is true with um, sucrose. So foods that are allowed on the specific carbohydrate diet include um, non-starchy vegetables like green leafy vegetables and broccoli and um, things like that. 
Um, the sweets that are allowed are honey, fruit, or juices. So if you're working with somebody who says, I, I feel worse when I eat honey, I feel worse when I eat fruit, this is not their diet. Um, they allow low lactose dairy, so homemade yogurt, hard cheeses, and dry curd cottage cheeses, and those are also allowed on the FODMAP diet. Um, all kinds of animal protein, um, legumes. Um, in the original diet, people were allowed to have some. Now that people have been using, using it for a while, sometimes they'll put them in a phase two. Um, nuts, seeds, and nut butters. Um, and then oils like avocado, coconut, olive oil, ghee, pretty much anything. And then bone stocks. So some of the research that we have is um, this was the first paper by Susskind. Um, seven children um, were put with pediatric Crohn's disease, were put on a specific carbohydrate diet for five to 30 months. Um, they weren't on any medications and all of their symptoms notably resolved in three months. And also their labs normalized or significantly improved. Um, a long time ago, a nutritionist named Shanti Caro interviewed me for his radio show. And when he was in high school, he got diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And he lived in Italy at the time. He's Italian. And his parents, in their wisdom, sent him to live on a farm. And he lived on the farm for a year. And he ate farm food, which was all homemade food. And he was with the animals and living, you know, a kid's kind of farm life. And um, all of his Crohn's disease completely disappeared. And when he was scoped, it was gone. And he's remained Crohn's disease free. I think there's a lot to be said with a whole foods diet and also with a specific carbohydrate diet in kids with pediatric Crohn's. Here is another paper um, on kids. and. Um, they did this for three months, and they didn't stay 100% on specific carbohydrate diet, but 85% of their calories, and all of their scoping improved. Um, so, and what they found was that the children who stayed on this diet for up to a year, that the longer they stayed on it, the better their Crohn's disease indexes were, and many of the children were completely Crohn's free. Um, this was the first paper that was done in um, adults with both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and 27 went on the diet, and 24 had significant changes in their ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease indexes. And what they did was they started with a four-phase, um, uh, like the most restrictive phase for a few weeks, and then they added a to phase two, and they kept adding um, to get less and less restrictive. Um, Suskind also did a web-based survey of people who tried specific carbohydrate diet, and 47% um, had Crohn's disease, 30, 43 had ulcerative colitis, and as often happens in inflammatory bowel disease, sometimes people don't have an exact diagnosis yet. Um, 4% went into clinical remission before they started the diet. 33 reported being in remission at two months of the diet, and 42% were in remission at six and 12 months. This compares to using any of the medications that we currently use for people who have inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and um, and as I mentioned before, there's recruitment in process for a big, um, a big trial um, in 34 sites to look at the specific carbohydrate diet and Mediterranean diets in Crohn's disease. So if you know somebody who has Crohn's disease, they can um, go onto the NIH website and see if there's a center near them or a center where they can participate in this. Now, there was also a recent study that looked at both the FODMAP diet and specific carbohydrate in a diet in irritable bowel syndrome. And the specific carbohydrate diet was a big bust. 
Um, the FODMAP diet worked really well, but basically the FODMAP diet showed that there was a lot of improvement. Um, the specific carbohydrate diet showed not that much. And um, they also saw in both of them that people's folate levels and also vitamin D dropped significantly. But in the specific carbohydrate diet, it dropped even more. And, you know, that's another issue with keeping people on these diets for a long time is they are going to have micronutrient insufficiencies. And we don't want to see that. So here's some um, resources for you. And um, there's even some supplements that are specific carbohydrate diet compliant so, um, so that you have some things that you can kind of look at. Um, and also, if you go to the breakingthevicioucycle.info website, they have a whole list of legal and illegal foods on this. And so you can see we just kind of got to almonds. Um, it's a really long list and um, something that you can download and that you can find really useful. The last category, so we've gotten digestion absorption and enzyme insufficiencies. Dysbiosis diets all restrict carbohydrates. Um, and I did not talk about the GAPS diet, but I will in my case study. Um, and um, um, anyway, and then we have also low antigenic diets. And so, these are for immune and inflammation and food allergy and sensitivity. So the first one I want to talk about is the six food elimination diet. And the six food elimination diet avoids these food groups, cow's milk, soy, wheat, eggs, peanuts and tree nuts, and shellfish. And as I said, we have um, a lot of research, over 30 studies in this. This was the first paper that was done by Lucendo. And what they did was on this diet, 73% of patients ex exhibited significantly reduced eosinophilic counts, which is, um, this is a biopsy that's done through scoping. And what they found was that in about a third of the people, one of these food groups was involved. In about a third, two of the food groups were involved. And in about the other third, three or more of these food of these six food groups were involved. And not surprising, the biggest offender was cow's milk at almost 62% of people, followed by wheat, eggs, and legumes. And the interesting thing about this was it was the first time that they demonstrated that if you do scratch testing or true allergy testing on people, that the diet worked better than what the allergy testing demonstrated because the allergy testing wasn't that accurate. So I have a question about low histamine diets for eosinophilic esophagitis. Nobody's ever done the research on it, but because this is an allergy that happens in somebody's esophagus, I would think that this would be a really good diet to try, and um, I'll just tell you kind of a story about my own husband. My husband has eosinophil had eosinophilic esophagitis and had been having swallowing problems occasionally for decades. And he'd go in and get scoped, and, uh, and they kept saying, no, you don't have it, blah, blah, blah. And then finally, he got diagnosed with eosinophilic esophagitis. So for the first three months, he did what his doctors told him to do. He used this kind of inhaled steroid, and he took a proton pump inhibitor to block his stomach acid, and he went back in three months, and he was scoped, and there was absolutely no change at all. And the whole time, I'm kind of saying, hey, honey, why don't we try this diet? And he's like, no, 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 I'm just going to do what the doctors say because it's really hard to work with somebody who doesn't want to change their diet. So finally, I said, okay, you did this for three months. Let's do the diet. So we did the diet for about five months, and he went back, and he was scoped again. And his own gastroenterologist was kind of like, yeah, we'll see see, we'll see what happens, you know, and he got scoped again, and he had zero eosinophil, zero, so his eosinophilic esophagitis was gone, and he also had no 
narrowing in his throat for the first time in a couple decades. And so then he started adding foods back in. And for him, he discovered that dairy was the biggest culprit. And he start, was doing really, really well for quite a while. And then he started getting swallowing issues again. And so he started thinking, hmm, you know, maybe what I'll do is I think that wine and beer, even though I, he didn't drink a lot of them, you know, they were treat foods for him, but he really discovered that he felt like it was inflaming his esophagus. So he stopped eating those, um, drinking beer and drinking wine, and he found that he got way better. Now we're about three years into this experiment, and he's again having a little bit of issues. And I um, hate to say it, he's not really interested in doing the diet again, so he's trying a different medication, and we'll see if that works. And if it doesn't work, then um, we're back to the diet, and we'll try to figure out what other foods might be affecting him. But he's part of that 73% who really get better from just changing their diet, which is so much better than using steroids or acid blockers. The next diet that I want to talk about is the comprehensive elimination diet, which is a little bit less restrictive than the six food elimination diet. And I've used this for decades and I find that, oh my gosh, this is my go-to diet for most people, unless I have a diagnosis that makes me want to choose one of the other diets. So um, pain, inflammation, autoimmune issues, mystery issues, which so many of our clients have these days, mood disorders, GI issues, allergies, eczema, asthma, history of antibiotic use or food sensitivities, this is my go-to diet. And what's allowed on it are fruits and vegetables, non-gluten containing grains, um, fish, organic poultry, lamb, bison. Um, it doesn't have to be organic, but if possible, that's great. Um, flax and coconut. And I also allow um, seeds like pumpkin seeds and chia seeds and uh, flax seeds, um, uh, sunflower seeds. Um, little bits of sweeteners like brown rice syrup or stevia or even tiny bits of sugar or honey or maple syrup. The question isn't like how do I sweeten so much as how much sweetening am I using and the answer is very little. And then if somebody's already really used to eating lentils and beans, they can continue eating them if it's their main source of protein. But we know that the lectins in legumes really bother some people. And we also know that somebody who's not used to eating beans can get a lot of gas from eating them. So it's not something you want to introduce. And, um, you know, people can have oils like coconut oil, olive oil, sunflower oil, um, uh, all different kinds of things. And um, you have a handout that actually compares all the different foods in all of these diets. So you can look at that, it's a little bit more detailed. Um, and the comprehensive elimination diet, as I said, I've used so often and, oh my gosh, um, I had one client who had arthritis and irritable bowel syndrome with cramping and diarrhea and he, he um, was depressed and he was obese. And in two weeks, on the comprehensive elimination diet, his arthritis was gone, he had lost eight pounds, his irritable bowel syndrome was gone, his pain and swelling throughout his body was gone, and um, within three months, he felt like a whole new person. So, you know, these diets can really help somebody very quickly, and um, what I usually like to do in terms of implementation is ask people to do whatever diet we're going to do for two weeks, 100%, and then come back and we're going to sit down and we're going to see what happened. And if they're feeling amazing, I'm going to ask them if they could do it another two weeks. And if they're feeling just kind of so-so, I'm going to ask them if they can do it another two weeks. And if they're feeling no change at all, 
I might ask them if they would do it for another two weeks, but we might use a different diet because maybe this isn't the right diet. Um, and then we're going to start introducing. So we also, as I've mentioned, we have one paper on using an autoimmune paleo diet for people with inflammatory bowel disease for six weeks. And people had um, had inflammatory bowel disease for at least 15, um, 19 years uh, was the average, um, was the mean. Um, and uh, about half of them were using biologics like Humira or uh, the injectable drugs that are used for inflammatory bowel disease. And in six weeks, they eliminated grains, legumes, nightshades, dairy, eggs, coffee, alcohol, nuts, seeds, refined sugars, oils, and food additives. And they ate fresh foods, bone broth, fermented foods, vegetables, fruit, um, and uh, root vegetables. Um, and they felt uh, uh, animal foods. And they, they actually got a great reduction. Um, so what they found was that on 11 out of 15, they were in clinical remission in six weeks, and they maintained that at 11 weeks. Um, this is equal to the benefit for most drugs, um, and this can be used along with conventional therapy, but what I would suggest is if they're in complete remission, then seeing if they can work with their physician to reduce their need for injectables or Humira or any of the biologic drugs or other drugs that they've been taking. Um, it can be difficult because these are great profit centers in most gastroenterology clinics. So um, um, anyway, but um, you know, can people be weaned? And I think yes, they can. Um, and but two patients, they actually got worse. So we need more research on um, paleoimmune diets and people with um, GI issues. This is the only one that we have so far. But empirically, we have lots of uh, anecdotal cases where people have improved. And so here's um, the paper, and here's kind of what they allowed and what they didn't, uh, what was allowed on the diet. And here's more of what was allowed. So the restoration diet is um, one that I just made up, and it's it's a diet that I use when people come to, when people used to come to see me and they were eating only four foods, they were living on a medical food and two other foods. I had one person living on peptamin, which is a medical food, and frozen vegetables, and that's all she was eating. Or I had another gentleman; he was eating. Um, ultra meal, which is a medical food, and um, he was eating white rice and apples, and he'd been doing that for a year. So the restoration diet is one that I kind of put together. It's like, huh, well, how do we make a soft foods diet that's also a whole foods diet? So soups and stews, this is time to get out your crock pot or your instant pot and start making really well-cooked foods. This is the time to make smoothies and bone stocks. This is the time to pressure cook beans and, um, and just kind of slowly reintroduce foods while you're healing somebody's gut and while you're looking at the other stressors in their lives. And then finally, we have the elemental diet. And the elemental diet is actually, you don't eat anything. Um, but it changes the gut microbiome really fast. And people usually stay on this for two to three weeks. Um, it has been used for people with eosinophilic esophagitis and was the main thing used until we got this new six food elimination diet. For people who have inflammatory bowel disease, they'll often put people on this before they do surgery. Um, if people have a celiac that's not responding, pancreatitis, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, we have one paper. Um, short bowel syndrome because people have had part of their colon or small intestines removed, um, and for other different things. And it's a great treatment for dysbiosis of all torts. The problems with it is that you're only drinking this and it doesn't taste good. It tastes really kind of bitter and crummy. 
And you want to make sure that somebody keeps their calories up so that they are not losing a ton of weight. A lot of times people are actually already too thin, and so you don't want to like compound that issue because malnutrition is no joke. Um, and sometimes, uh, like Dr. Allison Seebecker will allow people to have little bits of um, a baked chicken with no skin, with nothing really on it, or um, a little bits of uh, weak coffee or weak tea. Um, so sometimes you have to broker a deal. Yet what one paper from um, Mark Pimentel and his group demonstrated that in small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that about 80% of people responded to two to three weeks on an elemental diet. So this has been around for you know decades. Um, somebody has to feel really terrible to be willing to do it, but it does reset the microbiome. So think of it as a microbiome reset emergency plan. So I'm gonna finish by discussing a case for you. Um, this is a woman named Angeline and she came to see me. And one of the things that was developed at the Institute for Functional Medicine Is, um, is a timeline. And one of the reasons I picked her is because her timeline is so telling. So you look and um, she was breastfed, but she was constipated pretty much from birth on and was a constipated baby. Um, she's happy in her life. She's getting married. She loves her work. She feels rushed all the time. She works really long hours and she just finished getting her master's degree in special ed, and she does yoga and she sings in a choir. So she's got some really good things going on. You can see from her timeline that when she was um, 14 years old, she was baby, um, right before that, she had been sick with a flu-like syndrome. And a lot of times people start having irritable bowel syndrome that's called post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. And that's really her case. But also she had a huge trauma. So she was babysitting and the baby died while she was babysitting of sudden infant death. And from that moment on, she started having stomach pain every day. And she saw a gastroenterologist and was diagnosed with, with irritable bowel syndrome. <coughs> um, and she would have constipation type with bouts of diarrhea. Then uh, um, eight years later, she had a colonoscopy. There was a little polyp, but everything was normal. Um, when she went to college, she had anemia. So she tried an elimination diet with no soy and no lactose. And she found that it really helped her IBS and her anemia. So it makes me start wondering, could she have celiac disease that was never diagnosed from the time she was tiny? Um, 2008, she had another colonoscopy, which was normal. Her whole life, she's had irregular menstrual periods, um, except for the last three months. Um, now she's having a couple a month. And then she's had allergies. She uses a neti pot. She's been diagnosed with gastritis. And her doctor gave her an acid blocker because she's having these start pains and she's losing weight. And she's having vaginal infections. So and severe gas all the time. So I'm like, well, what do we do? When we look at her food diary, she loves sugar. She's eating kind of well, but it's a little, you know, heavy on sweets and carbs. So it's like, well, those gotta go because I think they're really causing some problems. So our initial plan was to initiate the specific carbohydrate diet or GAPS diet. She wanted to kind of merge the two. Um, gut and psychology syndrome diet and um, to, it gave her a recommended a probiotic supplement and um, that she you know uh, uh, get some probiotic rich foods and prebiotic rich foods and then I asked her physician to test her for celiac for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth for vitamin D and possibly stool testing so in three weeks she came back and she said her stool test um, for her breath test for SIBO was negative, but her doctor treated her with rifaximin, which is kind of a cool antibiotic because it mostly stays right in the gut 
and it has some prebiotic effects. So it feeds the microbiome and actually benefits the microbiome. And she's reporting that she has no irritable bowel system syndrome, that her anxiety, which she's had lifelong, is gone, that her allergies are gone. Her menses came and it was regular and it's the best she's felt in her life. And then with an eight-week follow-up, she says, I feel great on the specific carbohydrate and GAPS diet. My digestion's so good lately, but when I ate rice, I got horrible gas, and it reminded me of the old days, and if I eat beans or lentils, I get immediate pain. So I said, you know, we see this when people do the rifaximin. Sometimes after a little while, they start feeling worse again. So I use Jerry Mullen's protocol for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which uses either Metagenics FC Cidal, uh, Metagenics um, Candibactin AR and BR, two daily um, of each, uh, twice daily, so four a day, um, build up slowly of each of these for a month, um, or Biotics FC Cidal and um, I forget the name of the other product um, from Biotics, but if you use Biotics products, they know the protocol. And again, um, for a day of each of these two products for a month. And I said, continue with your probiotics. And I added some protein splitting enzymes on an empty stomach to uh, daily, um, to uh, twice a day, um, because I just wanted to kind of reduce inflammation and see if we could um, support her immune system a little bit better. So, oh, here's the, the protocol. So the other one is FC Cidal and ADP. And so you have this. Um, and 12 week follow up. I haven't felt this good since birth. Even when I'm sleepy, I'm still more clear headed than ever. Six months, um, she was exposed to some stuff. But she was still feeling really good digestively. Um, she's on the GAPS diet with GAPS. She can have little bits of pasta or ice cream. Beans are still giving her gas. And she's going to have her wedding in two weeks, which was her main motivator. Like she wanted to be feeling good on her during her wedding and honeymoon. And then nine months later, after learning what I can and can't eat, I now have a better relationship with food, one that doesn't involve pain. I'm happier and more energized, and I'm expecting my first baby this spring. So that's the power of the right diet in the right person. And again, we're using the DIGIN model to kind of break down these diets. And you have this handout that kind of shows you the differences in the different foods, um, in the different diets, so that you can kind of see what might work best for somebody. And um, you have, always want to kind of work backwards to try to open up somebody's diet so they can eventually eat a whole foods Mediterranean type of diet. And I hope we've reached these learning objectives. And um, if you want to reach me, here's my contact information and my books. And the fifth edition of Digestive Wellness is coming out in just a couple weeks. So it's available now from bookstores for pre-order. So that's what I had to say. And I know I ran a little bit over, but um, Paula, do we have some questions? We have some questions. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, and while we're at questions, if you wouldn't mind um, re-showing the food dairy diary and the Mullen protocol, let that rest up there for a little bit so people can actually see what she was doing, what she was eating, and then what Jerry had to say. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, lots of questions. Good, everybody. Bring them in. Now's the time. <laughs> in terms of transit time tests, going way back to the beginning, you talked about a handful of, char uh, of charcoal. <laughs> like that was kind of a, a scary general recommendation. <laughs> yeah, let's just like bind you up for a month. Um, but also just to indicate that what you're doing here is testing, you're ingesting something, testing, timing when you took it, and then when you next see it in the stool. The first time you see it in the stool, and then the last time you see it in the stool, because it might appear more than once. And um, to, re you know, record the length of time, that, and then you get your average transit time for the substance that you ingested. You can also use, I find, beets 
are a good marker okay. for that. And corn always shows up. Nobody chooses their corn kernels, it seems like. So I yeah. just wanted to but, um, fill that in a little those, bit. Those both work really great. And when I say a handful, it's like six to 10 capsules of charcoal. Okay. <laughs> so it is kind of a little small handful there. Yes. All right. And, you know, the handout Liz is referring to is on your webinar control panel. You can download it from there. Please take a look at that. Um, you talked about in the beginning, Liz, of gas imploding, almost always um, indicating an impaired microbiome and then to be able to address that. So in addressing microbiome, is it... Um, associated with all the protocols that you've given for the various diets of how you would support microbiome specifically? It is. So when we're talking about microbiome, we're always, always restricting carbohydrates. So the specific carbohydrate diet and the FODMAP diet are both restricted carbohydrates diet, carbohydrate diet. We don't have any research on the gut and psychology syndrome diet or like an antifungal diet, but those also restrict your types of carbohydrates and the amount of prebiotic and carbohydrate rich foods. Um, an Atkins type diet, again, we don't have GI or autoimmune research on it, but it probably would work as well because it's the same kind of low carbohydrate restricted carbohydrate diet. A ketogenic diet probably works for exactly the same reason, and that's also why the the elemental diet works because you're really restricting carbohydrates because the bugs, the microbes that are out of balance, love to eat on sugars and carbohydrates and prebiotic rich foods. So you're starving them out. Um, and when we talk about dysbiosis, like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, a lot of times it's just that they're mm -hmm. not even pathogens. They're just microbes that belong in your colon that somehow have backed up into your small intestine and they don't belong there. And so it's like, how do you bring that back into balance? And the best mm -hmm. way to do that is with food. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. You know, coming back down to the um, to the elemental diet, you said that's a no food diet, but that there's a drink that stinks, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> basically stinks, then tastes good. So it's a medical food. It's it's a it's a product in a jar that you mix up, and they can't make it taste good yet. Is that right? Yes, and there are many of them. Peptamin is um, one. Um, Neocate Junior is another. There's there's all kinds of uh, ones made by kind of the big companies like Nutritia America or Nestle's um, make these products. And then there's also one um, made by integrative therapeutics that people can buy from some of the integrative um, supplement distributors or directly from integrative therapeutics. And they just don't taste good, you know? Um, Dr. Seebecker is kind of like, well, you could put a couple, a little bit of stevia in it to make it taste a little better. Um, some of them have flavorings in them to make it better. And mm -hmm. you can also go to Dr. Allison Seebecker's site, and she has a homemade recipe for how to make your own elemental formula. Okay. Um comment here that elemental diet is described as singular versus plural so her understanding that various there are various versions do you have recommended versions and could a integrative functional rd create their own version using a blenderized um, they see a bunch of other um, whole food based products out there did that make yeah, sense yeah so so um uh, Dr. Seebecker has one that it's on her website. Um, I think it's seboinfo.com, uh -huh. um, I think. It might be sebo-info, but if you put in her name, Allison Seebecker, S-I-E-B-E-C-K-E-R, um, you'll find it. And she's got kind of a homemade recipe. The The most important thing about these elemental diets, yes, you can make one in a blender, but the most important thing is that you have really easy to utilize carbohydrates, 
amino acids or peptides and um, an oil. So they have medium chain triglyceride oils and other really easy to utilize oils. Mm -hmm. And then they usually have vitamins and minerals. And the idea is you just want to give your GI tract a complete rest. And we used to think, ah, the rest was the big deal. Yes. And the newest research is saying, yeah, the rest is good, but it, this is a microbiome reset. So I think absolutely this is in the scope of practice for any nutrition professional, dietitian, nutritionist. Um, this is definitely in our armamentarium. Absolutely. When you were speaking about the paleo immune diet, that's different than the autoimmune protocol diet. Is that correct? You know, all I showed you was what they actually used in the in the um, in this pr particular study. Uh -huh. But I think that if you look at autoimmune paleo diet, that you're going to or autoimmune diets, they're going to be pretty close to this. Except that there's no eggs. There's no nuts and seeds, there's no non-starchy vegetables, there's hardly any fruit, um, there's no dairy. Well, they're non, they're non, <laughs> it's the most non restrictive diet. Vegetables. But there's yes. non-starchy vegetables. There's right. just no starchy vegetables. But Correct. Yeah, there are, yeah. So, um, and, you know, so this is one paper that was done with one particular diet, and that's all we have so far. Right. So for me, I'm always going back into PubMed and saying, mm -hmm. like, what have we actually looked at? We mm -hmm. are so early in all this. Yes, we really are. We're so early. And, you know, we see people getting great results with autoimmune protocols, but we don't have research on it yet. And I would never put eggs in there. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to say to everybody, that's asking that we recorded this and the replay will be up on our website in just a few days so all the slides will be there available to download you'll have the handout that you can access right now um, when you're reintroducing foods Liz um, do you have a system that you're using for frequency how, how many you introduce at a time how long you monitor that before you move on to introducing another food? Well, I'd like to hear how you do it too. I think we all have our kind of own tricks for how we do it, but um, I really like to have somebody on an elimination diet, whatever of these diets that we're using. You know, um, whatever of these that we're using, I want to try those for at least four weeks, and especially mm -hmm. with the uh, immune inflammation, gut permeability, um, we know that that the half life of our IgG antibodies is about 28 days. So if somebody can be off those foods for at least four four weeks, we're going to get a better bang for our buck when somebody tries to add foods back in. Um, so typically. I will start, there's usually some negotiating. Somebody will come in and say, I'm desperate for a piece of bread or <laughs> I'm, I'm desperate for um, cheese or I can't live without this. And so usually the one thing that they're desperate for is where we'll start because that's often the thing that they're going to have the worst reaction to. Yeah, yeah. Good and one. I like, and I like to have them eat that food at least twice a day for two or three days uh -huh. as long as it doesn't give them a bad reaction if it gives them a bad reaction then stop you know immediately but what happens really frequently is you'll see somebody will eat something one day and they'll eat it a couple times and they'll go yay i felt really great and the next day when they eat it, their antibodies are shouting at them, I told you I don't <laughs> like this. <laughs> so, you know, the second or third day might be where the body just starts having a tantrum and telling you not to eat it. That's right. Um, sometimes it's not obvious. So sometimes somebody will 
reintroduce the food and you really want to try to do them like one at a time. So you might say, well, I'm going to start with noodles because they're just wheat, right? Although some people have said to me, they're made from from semolina, that's not wheat, or they're made from dirt, <laughs> that's not wheat. <laughs> that's you a know. different word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're types of wheat. So, but you know, but I wouldn't start with an egg noodle because that's wheat and egg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, things combined. Well, just briefly, for me, um, I would encourage anybody to stay on a new food plan, a trial food plan like that, for at least four to six weeks to give it a to give it a fair sense. But um, we might see improvement very fast because offending foods were taken out, and so they're not reacting. That's a good sign. Why do we continue that? that? Because <laughs> healing takes time. <laughs> What, when we've been eating problematic foods, they're doing damage to the microbiome, to our gut lining, and that takes more time. And so there's the urging to stay with this. There's healing that can happen here. You can feel better on this before we start yeah, reintroducing. And you know, yeah, and you want to make sure, do they have yeast overgrowth? Do they have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Yeah. Do they have leaky gut? because you want to also support with supplements or herbs or uh, talk with them about stress in their lives or any mm -hmm. of the other or have them do acupuncture to start really looking at some of the other pieces that support it's not just diet that's right and then just the last piece on on reintroduction i think it's one of the most important it's easier to eliminate the foods and see what happens than it is to reintroduce because people are eager to keep eating it and to bring in more, you know, faster. I want all those foods back. It is key to take our time. So three or four days for reintroducing a food and monitoring if it's reactive, then certainly we're going to take it back out. We're not going to continue to be ingesting it for a while. And if there isn't any reaction, then maybe, but not until we start going through the other foods that have been eliminated to see how they're reacting or not with those. Yeah, you know, and sometimes I'll also, when I was in practice, I'm not now, but when I was in practice, I would use food sensitivity testing, IgG or Ig4, to also look because sometimes you would catch something that you that somebody didn't realize was bothering them by doing some testing. And so sometimes you'll see that there's another food or there might be three or four foods that show up and most of them don't provoke symptoms, but one or two of them might. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what, which of the diets would you recommend for somebody that had a systemic yeast infection? I would use an antifungal diet or, or an elemental diet even, or you know, I would really restrict carbohydrates mm -hmm. um, because yeast love sugar. They just love sweets. I remember a long time ago, I went to see a friend who's an acupuncturist and I had been dealing with kind of low grade yeast overgrowth for a long time and mostly it was gone, but every once in a while it would just rear its ugly little being and she said, look, I want you to eat animal protein and vegetables and not root vegetables, you know, non-starchy vegetables and a little bit of oils. And I want you to do that for the next three weeks. And I was like, that sounds terrible. I don't want to do that. You know, basically Atkins type diet. And I, I really didn't want to do it. And then I, I was getting my acupuncture treatment and all of a sudden, this little voice came up. It's like my yeast overgrowth. Who are you going to be without me? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, all of a sudden, my resolve was really strong. Like, I want to see who I'm going to be without you. And yeah. really, since that treatment and doing that diet, it has never, ever come back. Listening to, listening to our, our bodies is, is, is so very important. But I love the story, Liz, because even you, you know, <laughs> I resist making a dietary change, particularly that one. 
and then, you know, famous, you know, gastrointestinal <laughs> person that you are can't convince her husband <laughs> to make a dietary change. It just speaks to how attached we are to our foods and how much they comfort us, even if they hurt us. Even if they hurt us. Right, right. You know, and that's, yeah, even if they hurt us. And, you know, so much of what we do, there was a new study that came out recently looking at the quality of the food we eat in America. And 71% of what we eat, 71% is ultra processed food. Mm -hmm. Ultra. Ultra processed. It's not like you had a rice It's cake. almost not food. Yeah. It's not like you had a rice cake. It's that you had Doritos or you had, you know, something that was unrecognizable to what it started out from. Right. Not mentioning the elemental did. diet here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Just a couple more questions if you can hang in there. Um, the sure. Mullen protocol, would you do that along with a certain diet? I would do that along with um, a, a diet when somebody had small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or when somebody had a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome or, um, you know, there, because we're nutritionists and we're nutrition professionals and dietitians, our viewpoint is slightly different. Dr. Mullen is a gastroenterologist. So he is going to do testing before and he's going to do testing after. And um, he actually published this as a paper. So, um, you know, he's going to want to do a lot of testing. And a lot of physicians who work with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, specifically, they want to do testing. And they want to do the testing before you ever try any of this mm -hmm. to actually mm -hmm. see does somebody really have small intestinal bacterial sure. overgrowth or not. However, there's a whole other group of people, uh, clinicians, who say, well, you know, let's just try it. And as a nutritionist, I'm not using it for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. What I'm using it for is to balance the microbiome and to balance dysbiosis. Um, and, you know, one of the great things is, for example, like if you use ABP, it's an oil of oregano. So it's antimicrobial and it's antifungal. Um, the candibactin uh, AR and BR are also antimicrobial and antifungal. And so, you know, we're not trying to kill off all these microbes. We're just trying to bring better balance mm -hmm. because these microbes actually belong in our gut. Mm -hmm. um, but there's just too many of them, and they've just kind of taken over. Do you have a recommendation for a competent lab that you'd recommend for IgG food sensitivity testing? Um, I really like, um, oh my gosh, you can do it. Lab. Um, they're in Atlanta. They're really great. <laughs> um, Dunwoody Lab. I Dunwoody. like them a lot. Dunwoody. And they also test for complement reactions, which is so they're testing for IgG and they're also testing for the innate immune system. I also like um, U.S. Biotech quite a lot. Mm -hmm. I like Meridian Valley Lab quite a lot. I think you get a lot of different foods for the amount of money that you pay. Um, so those are kind of my favorite labs right now. Okay. Um, one last question. I don't know if we have enough time for this, but um, how can we wisely do an elimination diet for a client with anorexia nervosa? Oh my gosh. It's tough. Really tough. And you know, all of these, all of these diets can bring on people's tendencies to have eating disorder. Um, anorexia or a fear of foods or mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people don't ever want to add back food because this food bothered them a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I would be 
if I was working with somebody who had anorexia nervosa, my first my first goal is to nourish that person, and it's not to use any of these diets because they will have a disordered microbiome. They will have a lot of um, macro and micronutrient deficiencies, but until they're actually re-nourished and nurtured and have a more relaxed relationship with food, you can never use any of these diets. Right. Right, Wouldn't right. you agree with that? I, I certainly do. I certainly do. And thank you for just the caution in general, you know, of what this may bring up for people. So you thank you people, for that. I mean, I'm sure you've seen this, like you'll see somebody and like 10 years ago, somebody told them that artichokes weren't good for them and they're still avoiding artichokes. It's like, well, that was 10 years ago. Eat an artichoke and see how you feel, yeah. you know? The idea is that instead of having people walk on these narrow tight ropes of what they will eat is to broaden their path so that they can eat as many foods as possible. And as you heal the gut, hopefully that really expands and there might be certain foods that they never can eat like gluten or dairy or eggs. But in most cases, people can eventually add back in most foods to their diet and feel really great. That's right. That's right. Well said, Liz. All right. With that, I'm closing the Q&A section. Except for I will say one comment. Dr. Lipsky is fabulous. Thanks so much for all your hard work and for sharing this with us. That kind of so encapsulates welcome. all of the, the <laughs> positive comments there. All right. <laughs> I'll uh, remind you again, we recorded this. It'll be available on our website in just a few days. The slides, everything, the handout will be there. And there's a survey to fill out. Please fill it out for me. I take these things seriously. It matters. And um, yeah, wax on a little bit. You know, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you'd like more of, things like that. Our next webinar is a great follow to this. We have Tom Fabian back. He's He's an expert in microbiome, and he's going to be presenting on understanding micronutrient microbiome interactions, implications for optimizing gut health. And Fun. our next, right, right, good one. <laughs> Tune in for that, Liz. And wow. um, our next All About Alumni graduate interview is tomorrow, November 6th at 12 noon Pacific time with our Master of Science in Traditional Nutrition grad, Katie Lambert. She's going to be talking about all her post-grad activities and accomplishments and challenges. And, you know, I just have to say we've had so many previous terrific grad interview presentations, so check those out in our archives too. And with that, I want to say we conclude. I want to thank you again, Liz. I want to thank everybody for sharing this educational experience together. I wish you all the best of health. I look forward to meeting you again back here at our next presentations. And until we do, I'm going to continue to practice tending my optimal diet, as well as happiness and compassion and kindness, because what we practice grows stronger. So please join me in this too, and meet me back here next time. Thanks, everybody.